Music for this episode of About to Break is provided by Cat Beach Music. Whether you're looking to score an entire film or just need to find the perfect vibe for your next commercial project, our friends Bobby and Jen Hartree have what you're looking for. Check them out today at catbeachmusic.com. Everybody, welcome back to the About to Break podcast. I'm your host, Taylor Hughes, and this week we have a great conversation lined up for you on the only show where we talk about the ups and the downs of life in the entertainment business. Before we get into the show, a couple of things. First of all, uh, I, I went to a cool place this week that I have to tell you guys about. I was in Arizona, and it's been kind of a busy month, and I was going to be gone for five days. So rather than flying to Scottsdale, Katie and I and the girls, we all loaded up in the car, and we drove out there, did a little road trip. And uh, part of the time we were there, we stopped. It was nice because I could, on my breaks from performing, like I was emceeing this event, and in the afternoons we had some free time. So we just go hang out. Kids did the pool and had some fun with that. But then we went to this ghost town. And it was called Goldfield, Arizona. And if you've never been, it's totally worth it. It's full on like you would imagine a ghost town in Arizona to be. It's a little bit touristy, but I loved it. I loved every minute of it. Uh, They got a fudge shop and they do ice cream and they're doing gunfights in the street. And it's just this really rad little 1800s town that's been preserved out in the middle of nowhere. If you're ever driving through Arizona, I encourage you, take a little 30-minute detour off the road and check that out. I do want to take a moment and say a big thank you to all of our supporters on Patreon. Guys, I can't thank you enough. Those of you who have gone on the website, abouttobreakpodcast.com, and clicked on the Become a Producer button. This month we have, uh, well, we've got some new supporters. We've got Greg Benick this month and August Weboa and we've got Joshua Oot, and we've got Mike Forster. Uh, So encouraging every time I see someone go there on our website and click on the Become a Producer button. You may be thinking to yourself, Taylor, what is a producer? Well, a producer is someone just like you and I who love these shows and want to help make them possible. And it does take a lot of time. We spend time every week recording and editing and finding these amazing guests and traveling to them to produce the show and to bring it to you. And uh, our producers help offset the cost of that. They also make it possible for us to do things like live shows. So thank you to everyone who's gone on. And for as little as a dollar or more a month, you can become a producer. Just go on to the about to break podcast.com, click on become a producer and check out some of the rewards we have on there. We've got really cool stuff, uh, things that we send you in the mail, free tickets to shows, all kinds of stuff you can get for free by being a producer of the show. So thank you guys for taking the time to check out our Patreon. We really do appreciate it. A couple of dates that I want to mention to you. First of all, uh, today is February 21st. If you're listening to this podcast, the date comes out. I will be at the Paris Hotel and Casino at 7 p.m. tonight in fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm filling in for my buddy Jeff Savilico at his Comedy in Action show, and it's going to be a blast. So if you'd like to get more information on that, go to uh, the live show page on our abouttobreakpodcast.com website, and it will give you information on that. That is tonight, February 21st. I can't wait. It's going to be a blast. Then I take a red eye from there. I go to West Palm Beach to perform for a few days for a conference. I get back just in time for February 27th, Tuesday night, our first ever About to Break Live in Hollywood. I'm so excited about this show. I've got my buddy Wes Barker flying in from Canada to perform. My buddy Johnny Beaner, who was featured on the David Letterman show and headlines comedy clubs all across the country. He's going to be there with us. Guys, it's a free show where we're going to perform and we're going to talk about life and we're going to have a little live podcast. I hope to see you there. If you live out in my neck of the woods, we are doing a hometown show on March 3rd in downtown Upland at Charlie's Bar and Grill. That's just going to be a really fun night. I've got my buddy Nick Paul coming out for that. And uh, you've heard him here on this podcast. You may have heard me on his podcast. But we're going to have a great night that evening with some comedy and some magic and just uh, some hometown good old fun. If you'd like more information on any of those dates, just go to the aboutttobreakpodcast.com website, click on live shows, and you can get links to all the information on there. Enough of that. Let's get into the show. I have a new friend, and he has an amazing accent because he's from the UK. And everybody from the UK sounds smarter and uh, kinder and wiser 
than uh, than we do here with our weird California accents. I sat down with Mark James after seeing his show at the castle. He was performing in the late parlor, which is my favorite room. I'll be there in a couple of weeks. But it was so fun watching Mark because not only does his show combine comedy and magic and it's very interactive, but he also wove in some of the stuff that he does in his show over in the UK that is kind of like a sideshow freak vibe. Uh, He did a thing where he took a nail and he nailed it into his face through his nose. A six inch nail bottomed it out at the end of his nose. It was so surreal and so visceral and so creepy to watch, but I loved every moment of it. And he has so much information that he shares here just about the business side of being a magician, which I love because, you know, the ongoing question I get, I got it this week. As people say, oh, that was a fun show. And then they go, what do you do for a living? And Mark and I talk a lot about the what do you do for a living and how do you uh, pay the bills, being a magician, and what goes into making an act. He is such a great guy, so down to earth, such a cool fella. And um, a big shout out to his wife as well. She was so kind to let us uh, record this after his 12-15 show uh, at the castle. So it was a late night, but it was a great night. And I know you're going to love it. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the wonderful Mark James. No, I'm not a writer. Okay. Something is about to break. Hey everybody, welcome to About to Break. I'm Taylor Hughes and uh, I'm super stoked. This is the official latest start time we've ever had for a podcast. I am sitting right now in Hollywood at the fabulous Nirvana Hotel and not Casino with my new buddy Mark James from the UK. It sounds good when you say it. We're sitting in Hollywood. We are sitting in Hollywood. We are in Hollywood. It's a dream. I just want you to take a moment and just reflect on how Hollywood this moment is, though. Oh, yeah. We're doing a podcast at like 1 a.m. We're in a hotel, a historic Hollywood hotel. Yeah. Right next door to where Janis Joplin died. She yes. She like that place next door. Apparently. Oh, yeah. Did you really die right there? <laughs> yeah, there's like a hotel next door and that's where no she died. No way. Yeah. Can you get that same room? I don't, I don't know if it's on the <laughs> list. We have the uh, the luxury suite. We have the penthouse. We have the Janis Joplin dead we, room. <laughs> we do. We do. <laughs> Does that cost extra? If I we want the so. Janis murder suite. And you can have the same sheets. We can have... <laughs> Jeez, they, haven't, they haven't touched a thing. Man. Still like an and down old... the road is like where John Belushi died in the Chateau Marmont, the the hotel there. That's like um, there's a tour. There's a tour. Yeah, there do. is. Yeah. There, uh, uh, Nick Paul's brother-in-law runs the. I think it's his brother-in-law or his wife's uncle uh, d- runs the Dearly Departed tour, oh, which yeah. is a Hollywood thing. We want to go on that. Oh my goodness! You should talk to Nick. I yeah. bet he has the hookup. I'm a, I love death. You've seen my act, so you probably know that. <laughs> <laughs> I love how much we've talked about death in the first two minutes. But it's it's literally, the time right now is 12.39 on Valentine's Day. Oh, man. And our wives are saints because mine is at home and yours is right here allowing us to invade your... <laughs> yeah, she doesn't know what we're talking about. She's watching Netflix with headphones on. <laughs> but uh, she's here. She's alive. She's she's uh, she's awake. We're in... Uh, the Magic Castle owns a few of these great apartments. They do, yeah. This building is amazing. I mean, it's, um, it's like a historic building and it looks amazing. It really stands out on the street compared to the other places. It's got this kind of oriental look to it. It's called the Nirvana. And then you get in here and these spaces are just amazing, you know? Oh, it's yeah. like you can see the Magic Castle out of nearly every window. Um, right. and, you, and you just know ne- you can see Hollywood Boulevard from the balcony it's like um, you, you just can't never forget where you are in this place it's amazing and this was my first time going in the elevator which was ex- yeah. cool and also really sketchy at the same time it's yeah, like made of wood it goes really <laughs> fast and it's got that old style thing where above the elevator is like a cage that springs out and stops the elevator <laughs> so it's like you feel you slam into it you get yeah. like some air time it's like the Tower of Terror it is but in reverse but in reverse and you just yeah. hope it's not exactly like the Tower of Terror when you're going up yeah it. it's very cool I uh, everything about this place and also the rooms are themed so you've got like the Charlie Miller suite yeah um, you've got the uh the, where we're staying, this room is the Billy McComb room. Yeah. And uh, there are pictures of Billy oh. uh, all over the place. There are pictures of magicians everywhere. They decorate it uh, in a way that is filled with magicians. But there's even a, a plaque on the wall that says uh, reserved for 
Castle Employee of the Month, and it says dedicated to Billy McComb, and it's like a an old parking space plaque or something. So cool. The whole thing, it's just, it's awesome. I mean, they really look after you as a guest. The Magic yeah, Castle, oh, it's amazing. Come to work here. You get a fridge full of bottles of water, which you've got like a Magic Castle label on, and it's just great. I can't complain about anything. It's so good. I told you this earlier, and I'm going to put a link in the show notes for this episode, but you wrote a piece on your blog about what it was like, your first experience coming to the castle and then performing there. Yeah. And it's the best description that I've ever seen. I've never heard anyone put it into words quite so eloquently and in something where people can read it and and really experience it. So I'm going to put a link in there. It's fantastic. Well, thank you. I mean, it's funny that I wrote that like three years ago now and, um, I read it before I come back every yeah. time, you know, I, I'm not uh, in the habit of watching myself on video cause it's awful. And, you know, reading things I've written over and over again, but that one thing, I always read it before I come back and it makes me excited and nervous. And I think the thing that it really does for me is it gives me uh, the proper poise, like the correct respect for the, the level of this gig that I, I never forget my place in it. And I, I always remember that I'm lucky to work here. And even when you get to the third time you've been to a place, it's easy to become a bit laissez-faire and think, oh, I've done this before. This is going to be fine. Right. I can do this gig. But then reading your own feelings about how nervous you were and how terrified and how excited and hearing yourself describe that um, yep. can really put you back in that place. And so I find it handy to remind me that don't mess this up. Pay attention. Yes. Practice during the day. Don't be lazy. You know, like everything you can do to make it good. And the main thing in that blog, the the line that I always remember is, I'd read this book that said that happiness is doing something you love whilst simultaneously looking forward to something else you love. And I quote that in that blog, and Mm. it is never more true in my life than when I'm at the Magic Castle, because I'm performing in a show, and I'm looking forward to the next show, and I'm looking forward to the daytime before the show when I'm walking around and I'm, you know, do, I'm going to Universal Studios or I'm looking at these amazing places from where everything here is like a film that something was made here. And I'm enjoying that so much, but I don't have that feeling of, oh, I got to go to work tonight. Sometimes when you got to do a gig, I mean, being able to perform for a living is such a privilege and it right. never becomes um, boring. But every now and again, it's like, oh, I got to do this show. It's a corporate, it's going to be no <sighs> fun or whatever. But in this place, you never feel like that. And it's, the it's best. It, it doesn't have, you know, that we talk about the law of diminishing returns. Yeah. There's very few places and very few experiences in life where you're not, they're not dealing with the law of diminishing returns. Yeah. Like you go to Disneyland and you go on space mountain and it's amazing. And then you go on it, you know, 20 years later and it's still good, but it's not yeah, yeah. But I feel like the castle, every time I walk in there, I, I'm a five-year-old kid. Every time. And I just saw magic for the first time. And it's like Christmas morning. Yeah, it's and glorious, you, right? you read the list and you see the other performers. And like for me, I mean, I've only been in magic now for um, like 12 years. And so oh, there are people that are performing at the castle now that I remember – buying their DVD or reading their book or yeah. you know, something. And then you get to meet these people and they just by being on the bill, someone that you idolize will speak to you as if, although yeah. I never feel like, but as if you're equals and it really, it's a great leveler of feeling like if I met that person at a magic convention or on the street, I would be so nervous to talk to them. But when they come up and go, Oh, you're on the bill. You can have a real conversation with a person yeah. without feeling like you're, it's hard to explain. It's great though. You know, I mean, I had a terrifying experience last year. Sometimes in February, the Magic Castle can be quiet. Yeah. And there's a, my last show is 1230 in the Lake Parlor, which it's is scary. late. It's, and it's it, scary. It, it's scary. And it didn't happen tonight. And sometimes it doesn't happen. Last night it did. Um, but sometimes it won't happen. And last year I was here and Bob Gebert, who's one of the, the hosts and managers at the castle and is like the greatest guy. He said to me, I don't think the show's going to run. Um, so I set the show up just to perform the next day. So it was right. ready to oh, go. Oh yeah. You got to be ready to go. And then, and he said, oh, the show's going to run. There are people in the room. And I went, oh, cool. And I was set up. So I was ready to go. And I was excited. And I said, how many are there? And he said, well, oh, there's maybe 25. It's uh, the cast of Circus 1903 with, da- with David Williamson. What? And are I, you kidding me? I, I was like, what? And he went, yeah, David Williamson has brought the cast of Circus 1903 oh my in. Goodness. And I, I just thought... 
oh, and I was doing cards to pocket in my act, which like I love yeah. Dave Williamson. Yeah. So I'm thinking, oh, he's going to watch my show and he's going to be there. And like, <laughs> for me, the, the show was just for him. You know, that was mm-hmm. like, I was just constantly, you, when, I mean, you were in the show tonight. Yeah. And you're trying to do the show normal and you're, but you're trying not to look at the people that you've invited in or right. that you know, whatever. Yep. So I like couldn't look at David at all. I was like, oh, don't look at him. Don't look at him. <laughs> it was like, uh, he was like Medusa. I was scared to look at him in case I turned to stone and I might have done, had I. Right. So, but the show show was fun and david was really nice out to me after the show and we had a chat and i went to the close-up room with him and and then had a normal conversation with him that i couldn't have had elsewhere yeah and it, he just chatted to me like hey so what about this and what and it was it was great it was a real amazing experience and i mean the castle you can perform for anyone on any particular night but um for me it's it's your peers that make me the most yeah you know, they give me the nerves but and tonight the same when you're in the show i feel like oh, oh. these guys have come and i hope it's a good job but it's it was like, fantastic man well thank it you it was and and it's i think it's funny how Every time we watch one of our peers, I mean, it's not, people always go like, is it fun for you watching magic? Or are you just trying to figure out how it's done? And it's, it's none of that. It's yeah. just. Or usually, you know how it's done. But right. You don't care about that You know, anymore. it's like, I, I tell people, it's like a guitar player watching another player. Yeah. They know the chords. They know the scales. The power is watching people combine this with that. And yeah. it's so much more about the story and the journey and all of that. And it's like, I just. I freaking had so much fun watching you tonight. Well, thank you. That's really kind. It was really brilliant. Kind. It was I'm, so fun. I'm glad. I try to, um, I always aim to do a show here that, because I know magicians are going to see it. Right. So you've got to keep that in mind. Although you can't play to that audience particularly. Yeah. But it's nice to have some things that maybe people would go, oh, that was cool. Like yeah. they know how the trick works, but oh, you did that thing with it that was unusual or whatever. And so that's, you've got to be mindful of the crowd here because actually in the parlor, there are 56 seats. And sometimes 10, 15, 20 of those can be magicians. And yeah. you can tell because people are wearing their badges <laughs> and that they're members. Their, and sometimes we have our arms crossed. Guys yeah. have their arms crossed. And it's like, oh, buddy. It's funny when I do magic conventions, if you do, a, you know, I, I here magicians blend in with the crowd a lot better than they do right. when it's all magicians. <laughs> yeah. And they will laugh and they will join in. And the real people infect magicians that they become real people as well. Oh, yeah. And, um, I always say at magic conventions, you know, nobody laughs. And I always say, if a gag goes over, I say, don't worry about laughing. The sound of scribbling pens is enough. You, know? <laughs> like, you can take that line. It's funny. That's so. fantastic, man. I love my favorite thing to say at the castle, because you, you, you get to notice right away who the real folks are. We're in LA. Nobody wears suits anymore. No. So... My my favorite thing is to come out and say, how many of you bought a suit today? Yeah. And it's always 50% of the crowd or they're pointing at their friend or they're laughing or they say, he borrowed mine, you know? And it just kind of takes a little bit of the edge off. It's funny because there's a, there's a suit shop just down on Hollywood Boulevard, a, a huge place. And I think that place is kept alive by people who want to get into <laughs> <laughs> that guy knows like the amount he's of people. like listen this is the location we yeah. have the castle Dude. is it's such a the business model for it i don't know where else it could even work the castle yeah because i mean my wife and i were talking about this the other day we went to a uh, grand central market i mean let's talk about la the food here <laughs> is just like it's eight, insane the best ever the food is amazing even somewhere that's just like a burger place like in and out burger yeah the, i love that place it's great oh, dude i'm like um, i'm glad you like it because so many people they knock it and i'm oh, like no, it's a different thing great. it's amazing there's this place called fat sal's deli have you been there <gasps> the the sandwich the place sand- and they put freaking fries on the sandwich i can't pick this thing up it's insane <laughs> there's this place called chicken zang cow that i love oh uh, i just heard about it i've never had it i mean i've known of it but someone today was telling me chicken Chicken Zankow, it's amazing. Parallel that I've drawn with, I was talking to my wife Mm -hmm. about LA and how the Magic Castle could only work here because LA is so big and there are so many people. And like the thing about the food is Fat Sal's is amazing. It only sells sandwiches. Chicken (laughs) Zankow is amazing. It only sells like chicken plates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, There's a place in Grand Central Market we went to the other day. They basically just do eggs. They just say, egg slut. Yeah, man, it's the yes! best. Yes, I love that place. It's so good. And the queue was like around the block, but it was around the block for a place that only sells one thing. Right. And I think in England or in lots of other places around, um, even America, something like that couldn't survive because there aren't enough people. No. If you set up a business and you say 
all I'm going to sell is this one thing. <laughs> yes. you, they won't find enough people to keep you afloat. <laughs> but in LA, that can work. Yeah. There are enough people that tour here and enough people that are uh, living here that they can make a business model like that work. And the Magic Castle has got that exclusivity baked right in. Because uh, true, all yeah. they do is put on magic shows. They're right. not a theater that says Mondays is opera, Tuesdays is improv, Wednesdays right. is this thing. All they do is magic. And so everybody knows that's the place where you go and see a magic show. And any venue in another town that said all we put on is magic couldn't fill it. Not only can the Magic Castle fill it, but they say, we're not going to let you in. <laughs> yeah, we're going to yeah, make right. it so impossible to right. get into oh, yeah. this place. And we're still going to be full. I When I try to explain the castle to people, because they go, okay, wait, it's a private club. So can I like call? No, no, no. You have to have a pass. Yeah. Where do I get a pass? From a magic? It sounds like a riddle it's in a impossible. video game. It's like, find this man with the shepherd's crook. It's, uh, He's going to offer you a gold coin. Yeah. It's like, you've <laughs> got to know it. the real, some sort of mystery. It's like a labyrinth or right. something. Right. I mean, we, when we're using Uber here, people say, so where are you visiting from? Oh, we're from England and we're here. And oh, what are you doing? Well, I'm working at the Magic Castle. Wow, the Magic Castle. I've right. passed that place so many times. <laughs> How do you get in there? Right. This is my third year working. And my answer is always, I don't really know. Yeah. I'm not sure how you get in. I mean, there's a, yeah. I, I know that like I have a guest list that I could, but I mean, if I put everyone I get an Uber oh, with yeah. on the guest list, it would be crazy. But, um, you know, I know that there's a guest list that I could put people on, but I don't do that, and it's still full. It's nothing to do with me. This place is full every night. I think part of it, too, is because it's so exclusive. Yeah. If you're at a party, and there happens to be a performer or a magician or a member, and they give you a guest pass, you're going to go. Yeah, the demand is You know amazing. what I mean? It's not It's not where like people are like, oh, here's some comps to something that like I don't really care about. It's like, if this happens, you're going to go to yeah. this thing. And you, it might be your only chance ever right? in your whole yeah. life. I met someone today, uh, our Uber driver, her name was... Uh, Nishan and she was real nice and we, she, I brought up the Magic Castle. She said, oh, I went there like 10 years ago. I worked for the post office and there was this thing and the, you could win a ticket and I won one and my husband and I, we went and it was amazing Yeah, and they'd never been back. But they loved it and they've always right. wanted, they've wanted to go for 10 years yep. and, and they live in LA and they haven't been back. How it's, does it survive? But it does. Yeah. Every night of the year. Every night of the year. And it's packed. And it, it's just incredible. It's um, it's enviable that they've created something that's so amazing. And yes, it's it's obvious why. Because when you work there and you meet the people involved and you yeah. meet Jack Goldfinger, who himself amazing. is a, a riddle. Oh, yes. I amazing. Mean, everyone talks about this way that he speaks. They call it Jackanese. Jackanese, yeah. And the conversations I've had with him are like, he told me... Um, when I, I said to him, he, after my first time I ever worked here, he came up to me and he was like, you've arrived. That was a great show. You, we want to have you back. And I went, great. And he said, tell me when your birthday is. And I told him and he put it into his cell phone. Yeah. And he said, when it tells me it's your birthday, I'll call you to come to the castle. And he's like, that's how I'll remember that you'll come. Glorious. And then it came to my birthday and two days went by and he hadn't called me yet. <laughs> and I was like. <laughs> I love that it's your birthday. That's all you can think yeah, about. Yeah, I'd like, been waiting like Jack, six yeah. months because yeah, I was yeah, here yeah. in February and my birthday's in yeah. August. So I'm like the only day I care about. I'm like, it's my birthday soon. Jack's going to call. And it's the 25th of August. He didn't call. It's the 26th. And it's the 27th. And I'm like, I'm going to call Jack. Yeah. So I called him. Your son's and, like, uh, daddy, I made you this. Yeah. It's not a call from Jack. I don't care about this. Get out of my face. <laughs> So Put it I, on the fridge. I called Jack and he's like, hey, Mark, you know, we need to talk. We're going to get you back at the castle. And I said, um, yeah, I would love to come back. And he went, well, first I got to see how the sausage is made. And then this and that. And I'm like, and it got to the point where I was thinking, he's really talking about sausages. It's like, I don't know if there's an analogy coming. And then he, then he's he like, he's like, are oh, the nitrates. Yeah. <laughs> and then he tied it up in a way that totally made sense. Yeah. And it's glorious. It's like, but the thing is, Jack is so smart, not just in the way that he books the castle and he knows yeah. which performers will work together. Right. When he watches your act and he says, he might say one sentence to you and you'll think, oh, and then he'll go. And then all night that sentence is in your head. Yeah. And then the next day it's there. And then you might change something to do with what he said. And then you really work out what he meant. And it's like a gift. I remember my first time I did a show and he, I mean, you saw my show tonight. So yeah. it's, it's comedy based, obviously, so but fun. it's magic too. And he said to me, you know, for all he'd said, he liked the show. He said, it's the magic castle. And I went, it is. And he went, it's not the comedy castle. 
It's not the juggler castle. Uh. It's the magic castle. And I went, yeah. And he left the, and he left and it was like handshake and great. And I thought it really stuck with me. It was like, oh, was that a criticism or was it a, a tip or what? And so I really dialed the comedy back a little bit. Yeah. I was doing this juggling routine. I took it out. I switched all to magic and it didn't just change my week at the castle. It changed my whole show forever. Isn't that crazy? And, and I used to think of myself as a, a, a essentially a, I'm <laughs> reticent to label myself a comedian for fear of people who've seen my act listening to this and disagreeing. But I, um, I used to think of myself as a comedian who did tricks. Right. And now I think of myself as a mag a magician who is funny uh. and, and it's all I want to be. And it started with him saying that sentence. It's like, you know, in inception mm -hmm. when he says like that thing gets in your head, like, is this the dream? It's like a worm in your brain that can't, right. it never went away. And Jack changed my show. One sentence. It's amazing. Uh, when, and this may be something that's somewhat exclusive to magic because it's one of the few art forms and professions where you can meet your heroes. Yeah. It's like such a small community. I mean, you, you live on the other side of the pond. <laughs> yeah. As Bob says in my intro, 5,652 miles right. door to door. And w this is happening. At, you know, we're in Hollywood at one o'clock in the morning recording because of a Facebook message. Yeah. That's how small this world it's is. It's wild, isn't it? And, but like, if you're a singer and you're like, I'm going to be a rock star, you can't just phone up Bono. Yeah. Not that you or I are Bono, but I'm saying like, th this world is small enough. We're in the Billy McComb suite, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Billy was and still is one of the greatest ever. Yeah, I mean, and it feels fitting to me because I opened my show with Half Dead Silk. Yes. Which is like a real... I was going to bring that up. Yeah, popular trick for Billy. And, um, you know, it's it feels full circle to be in yeah. this room. It's good. Well, and, I, and I, as you're talking about Jack saying these words and how they stick with you, I was lucky enough to, because I live locally, I was a junior at the castle. Right. So I got in when I was like 16, 17 years old. And to meet guys like Billy, Billy would come to the junior meeting. He would show up early on a Saturday yeah. and we'd be workshopping and he'd sit in the audience or he'd come, you know, when we're doing future stars week and nervous and everything's shaking. Yeah. And I remember Billy saying simple things like he's, he'd be like, he would mention a joke that I said and how much he loved that joke. And then he would say, can I give you, he would always ask, can I give you a piece of advice? And I said, sure. And I remember one time I was doing a, like a professor's nightmare routine, you know, with three different ropes. Yeah. And he said, I've never noticed anyone using gray ropes before. And I thought, oh, I don't, I use white ropes. And then I looked at him and I went, I've looked at these so many times. Yeah. And I would pass them out to the audience. So you think about how many people have touched these ropes and it's a slow change. It's too. a slow change. And I looked and I went, oh my goodness, these ropes are dirty. And I'm so used to, Looking at this every day as I practice, every day as I pass it out, I didn't notice it. Yeah. But that, it, it, it sticks with me to this day where now I look at all my props or I look at my clothes and I think like, what is someone going to notice who's never seen me before? Yeah. But because Billy spoke that, you know, it's like we have, we have this great uh, gift given to us by being able to have not only access to these guys, but have these guys care enough about it as an art that they still will share. Oh yeah. It's incredible. And the, it, again, there's no place that it really happens, Yeah, but here, and it feels like a place that it's okay to do that. And it's okay to share and give people ideas. And, yeah. you know, usually after your show, if there are magicians in the audience, they may hang back in the room. And so you say, thanks to everyone. You come back in and right. they're the guys, you know, we'll have a little chat. What do you think? And I always want to hear like, my usual thing is, what was your favorite thing in the show? What was your least favorite thing in the yeah. show? Um, and kind of go from there, you know? And also you can, they, you, you can kind of work out how it's good to, I think the real tip um, is to work out which advice to take. Cause not all advice is good advice <laughs> yeah. and you have to be able to, to know what's right for you, but um, you should always listen. Yeah. Listen to it all, but filter it through. Like, yeah. You got to work out where to go with it, but you got to listen to everything everybody says. And if someone says something to you, there's a good chance somebody else thought that who isn't a yeah. magician. You know, it's like if one person thought it, fifty yep. other people might have thought it too. So you got to listen to what people say. And and the hard part is sometimes they'll say something that's true, but it like hurts. Yeah, you yeah. know. And so I, the the filter that I've used for the last several years has just been like, is what this person's speaking is it true? Because if it's true, it doesn't matter if it hurts. It doesn't matter who said it. It doesn't matter if they're not applying it in their own act yeah. or their own life. If it's true, it's true. So just, you gotta, 
It's hard though, man. <laughs> it's hard. When someone says something hurtful about your act or something that you don't want to believe, something that maybe is your favorite thing or whatever, it's like, and someone else doesn't feel the same way about it. No, it's a bummer, but yeah. But you're like, but I love that. Yeah, but I love that. I love it. I love that. It's, you know, there's okay, it's okay to have things that we do that are just for us too. Yeah, I have lots of them in my show. Um, and I think it helps you care about the material. It's yeah. funny, I was... Um, I was with Rob Zabrecki, at, who obviously is a member here and quite a prominent oh, yeah. member here. And uh, we were doing a convention, South Tyneside in England. It's coming up next month, actually, whenever this comes out. It's February awesome, now. Yeah. And it's it's in March. And Rob was headlining it last year, and I was the MC for the gala show. And um, we were talking about his act, and I, I said to him, I love that your act has got all of these quirky references and bits of music and all of those things. And he said, the thing about having a show that it really is who I am and what I love, yeah. I never have to fake my enthusiasm. Oh, that's good. And I love that so much that it, to, to put personal things in that you care about, even if the audience never even know about them, yeah, it makes you feel connected to the material. Um, even if it's cufflinks. Yeah. Like tonight, I mean, my right. favorite thing, um, I love movies so much. That's yeah. my favorite thing about coming to LA. We go to every movie location we can find. The House from Back to the Future, Union Station, you name it, we go right. there. Right, yeah, yeah. But in my show, um, I wear, the cufflinks that I wear are the pattern from The Shining, the carpet. Yep. And I have this Sharpie pen that's got this Sherpa cover thing on, and it's the pattern from The Shining, and they match. And I like that. And in my show... So I have a show in England called Sideshow Tricks yeah. that plays uh, twice a week in a sort of theater space. It's like a 140. Uh, no, it's t I never, I usually get like 140, but it's a 200 seat space. And um, it's a two hour show. The first half is comedy magic. The second half is sideshow, things like blockhead, needle swallowing, straightjacket escape, fire eating. And it's called Sideshow Tricks. And um, in it, I talk about, so the, 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 concept the the supposed high concept which i think is important to have even if the audience don't know about it right like a, a guy that i know mark elsden a magician he has this show called 10 and um the show is 10 tricks for 10 people um and each trick can only have 10 different words in it and it's really amazing and he puts only it, 10 different words 10 different words per trick what and it really makes the material amazing he does it, it in like art galleries and things not, yeah, yeah. yeah he has like these 10 mats in a semicircle and he stands there and the audience know it's called 10 and everything will be informed by the word 10 oh, that's they come cool. in they stand around him he does the 10 tricks 10 people 10 thing and it's great some of the tricks though, when he talked to me about it, he said, oh, this is influenced by this thing, this painting or this film or whatever. And that influence is not apparent to watch the material at all. Yeah. But it's still there for him. Yeah. And the other person that was with us when we were talking about it said, why limit yourself to that thing? And he said, without limitations, there's no art. Like right. the, the art comes from limiting yourself and not letting yourself go crazy and do anything you want. So high concept, even if the audience don't know about it, if you're going to say to yourself, I'm going to do a trick that's inspired by Edvard Munch's The Scream, you know, that thing of like the ghost looking person on the pier with the hands yep. and the mouth yep. open. Maybe at one point in the trick, you're going to emulate that painting and it'll oh, yeah. just be a snapshot photograph. Yeah. Nobody will even know, but you know, and it, yeah. it puts something in there that makes it better. So in my show, the first half is comedy magic and it's about me. It's autobiographical. All of the tricks are about um, how I got into magic. And I used to do, I mean, in Half Dyed Silk, I talk about um, how I got into magic. And I used to say, the first trick I ever saw was shown to me by my granddad. Yada, yada, yada. How many times have <laughs> we heard this? Like, every magician has done a trick in their career where they right. go, my granddad showed this trick. And actually the truth for me is that I first saw magic when I was on a day trip to Blackpool in England. I walked into a magic shop called JB Magic. Uh, the owner of that shop was Mark Mason, who's hugely famous in magic. Oh, yeah. And um, he showed me some tricks. It totally blew my mind. I spent Every penny I had, I, I tell people I left with everything but my wages, you know, like the, I, was, I bought everything I could buy <laughs> yeah. and I was hooked on magic. And then as fate would have it a year later, I moved to Blackpool and the place that I was working was like a 20 minute train ride away from 
the center where the shop was. And I had the opportunity to either live near the shop and get the train every day to work or live yeah. near work and occasionally get the train to the shop. And I lived right next to the shop. <laughs> and every day I had to get the train. You'd rather miss work than I'd, miss your time I'd in the shop. rather the pain of getting to work yeah. than be able to... I was working in a in a, a venue, you know, performing, like uh, emceeing and everything every night, still yeah. doing entertainment. But I lived near the shop and I went in every single day. And... Um, bugged mark you know show me more i wanted this one and yeah. i was buying things and one day i was sitting in the back talking to him after like six months of this we eventually gave in and realized i wasn't going to leave him alone right um and somebody came in and he was busy making some prop and he said oh would you mind going to see them and i said um i don't work here and he said you you're in here more than the people who do you'll be fine <laughs> so i went behind the counter and i showed them some things and as fate would have it this guy was like bought loads of things he cr spent a bundle of money with yeah. me but i needed mark to come and ring it up and he came and he rang it up and uh they left the shop and he said you want to come back tomorrow and i said i'm gonna come back tomorrow and he went no you want to come back and stand on yeah. this side tomorrow and he gave me a job I love so it. i ended up working for mark and um got hooked on magic you know even more that way it was like the greatest thing ever but um so in my show, I tell the truth. I say at the beginning, as you heard tonight, my life changed. One day I walked into a magic shop in Blackpool and I met this guy and he showed me some magic and now I want to do the same thing for yeah. you. And I go into the half-dyed silk. But I find that telling the truth at that point and as often as I can in my show yes. makes it so much better for me. Yeah. And so the first half of that show, Sideshow Tricks, is about uh, me and it's about comedy magic. And the second half, the sideshow part, is all about other performers. And I say, these are people from the sideshow. I talk about Melvin Burkhart, who is a yep. real person who did Blockhead. But then all of the other characters are based on real people. But I made them up. I got the. I have these banners and I have these pictures drawn and all this thing. But all of the characters, this is coming right full circle now. They're all <laughs> named after people in movies, uh, but nobody really knows that. Really, like two people ever have come up to me and said, "You quoted about ten movies in that show." But give me, nobody give ever me an knows. example. But don't tell me the movie. So, uh, in one of the uh, things, I say this guy is was worldwide known as the master of pain. He would perform these amazing illusions where he would take a needle and stick it through his skin. He would jam his hand into an animal trap his name was mola ram and he came from a place called pancot in india um and so you know you ever you got the link for that i don't got it it's yet. the name of the bad guy in indiana jones and the temple of doom <laughs> yes! the guy who tries to pull his heart yeah. out and there are some more obvious ones like there are these that i do cigar box juggling and i talk about uh, these two brothers um that were called the corleones which obviously is like a right. dead obvious i'm not even going to point that out it's an obvious gangster movie reference right. um and so <laughs> all of, that's the one but they're and they're all named after different characters in movies, and nobody knows, but I know. And and it um, gives you a giggle. It gives me a giggle, and I love that it's in there. And when I give them the pen with the shining uh, um, thing on it, I say, yeah. I take the pen back and I say I stole that from the Overlook Hotel, and, I, yep. and I, I try to put all of these things in that just make it richer for me. Yeah, and it doesn't take anything away from the show. No, but for the people who do spot it. It'll, it's a great little thing. It's like a it's like a trick that they don't even know That's what's it. happening. It's so nice to just it's, have it in there and just find things in your life that um, that make the show more interesting for you. Like they add layers. It's funny. I, I actually wrote a blog about this too. In that um, magicians tend to make up a lot of stories about their lives that are not right. true. And people can tell. I think they can. I think yep. when you say to the audience, like, so I used to be an underground gambler and you've never been to a casino, but you want to do some routine that's about second dealing or poker hands or whatever. Right. You go, I remember when I used to gamble in Vegas and do this, or I used to be a croupier or whatever. Yeah. And they've never done that. Yep. And actually... There are two ways you can go. Either you can make routines that are about the reality of your life, which will be so much richer and you'll have so much experience and you'll be able to right. talk about it in a more interesting way. Because anybody who really has been a croupier who's in that show right. is waiting for you to say something they can identify with and you're going to disappoint them because you don't, you don't know what it's about. And if you really did, you'd have some line or something that only that person would know and you would say it and for them it would make it real. And so the... Good. So you've got two two things you can do. Either you can make up routines that are about your real life, or you can take your lies and right. go and live them. What a great excuse yeah. for an adventure. If you're doing a routine now that's like, I used to be a croupier, go on a course. It's $200. Right. It takes two days. And you'll know so much more about that. And you'll have you a did. better story than the BS a you're making. better story. If I hear one more magician do a snowstorm and talk about some kid oh, they man. met at a hospital. Yeah. First of all, freaking go to a hospital 
Yeah. And serve people, you'll probably end up with a better experience than... And there are people who, I mean, it's very popular in England. One of my best friends, his name is John Harding. He uh, does that. He does magic in hospitals yeah. very frequently. And he doesn't talk about it on stage because he finds it gauche. It's a bit right. personal. How and dare you like... <laughs> yeah. And, and, and you always know the person who goes, oh, I went to a hospital and I met this kid who wanted to see it now. They talk about it in such a free, unaffected, not... Yeah. Um, disingenuous way there's no heart in it at all no. and the audience can smell that they really can so you know either make routines about your life or go and live your lives yes and i i love that go and live your lives man yeah like be, i i think we're afraid that what we're experiencing isn't valuable enough or yeah. that people won't care I just heard uh, Phil Rosenthal, the guy who wrote uh, oh, Creator of Everybody Loves Raymond. Yeah, and he does the show Somebody Feed Phil. Yeah, if Somebody I Feed love that Phil. Show. Yeah, it's fantastic. It, yeah. he, he said, I, he was talking and he said, I figured out the secret. He's like, you want to know the secret to making great uh, anything, any great content that people want? He's like, just tell your story. Tell he your said, story. He people, said, people think that their story is not valuable or that not relatable he said, the more we wrote for the Everybody Loves Raymond, what happened literally in my life, yeah, we would tell us a story of something crazy my mom did. And people would be, you know, thinking, he'd be thinking like, no one's going to relate to this. And people would come up and say, my mom did the same thing. Yeah. You know, and it's like, you're, we, when you get down to it, we're all on the same planet, breathing the same air, dealing yeah. with the same problems, sitting in the same traffic trying to pay the same bills. This is why I love something like Curb Your Enthusiasm, because the for all the stories are so wild, and yeah. they feel so intangible. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's the way the truth is. The, <laughs> the truth is in the details and the ridiculousness of how things happen. And yes. actually, a lot of stories that magicians tell in routines are so vanilla, because they're just the base, like, yeah. oh, I need an excuse to do this routine, so I'm going to just say that I went to Paris, and now the rest of the routine has absolutely nothing to do with it, but it's yeah. my link to get in. And, but yeah, just do routines about your life or go and live your lives. I hesitate. I hesitate to say this because I'm not. I'm maybe eighty five percent of the way there with my show right now. I don't lie to the audience. Yeah, and I've I've really tried to go back and go, is this true? Like the idea of like, I'm, people think magicians are deceivers. Yeah, and for a while, I had a friend who's an agent who was helping me, and he's like tried to coin me going out as like the magician you can trust, which I just hate the idea of that. But yeah. <laughs> I do like the idea of doing an entire show where people were amazed, but they weren't lied to. Yeah. You There's, know what I mean? Like you don't have to lie to people. I mean, if you watch enough movies, the, the thing that you'll know about people that go undercover is that the way to have a convincing undercover story is to make it as close to the truth as possible. And, you know, maybe it will make your magic so much stronger if nearly everything is true, right. apart from the deception in the tricks. The audience will trust you more. You'll feel genuine. Like, you, could, you know when someone's telling you a real story because they don't just go, I had this friend and he was called Phil and he was from Boston. They don't just say that. They go, I had this friend. He was called Phil. Phil Rosenthal. Uh, you won't know him, but anyway, I knew him. And he was from Boston. I think it was, was he from Boston? Yeah, he was from... My, they do that. There's a reality right. to someone telling the story. And it doesn't necessarily make for great script. You have to weed those... Eh, yeah. I think that blah, 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 blah. You have to weed that out. But there's truth in detail. And the, the truth is always interesting, no matter what it is. So, I mean, is there a better example of that than Derek Delgadio? His show in and of itself, it's, it is quite literally biographical. Did you get to see it? I, I, a friend of mine saw it recently. Yeah. I, I'm not going to get to see it because right. it's in New York and obviously I'm from the UK. Yeah. And um, my ability to come to America is usually uh, financed by doing a show. So, right. Yeah. Uh, unless he needs cover one day and I'll watch it the next day. <laughs> I can't see that happening. <laughs> I dare to dream. But um, yeah, it's... Uh, a friend of mine saw it and knowing I wouldn't see it, he described it to me in yeah. incredibly in intricate detail, like the day that he saw it, you know, he yeah. called me, I just saw this, this is what happened. And it's, it's obviously very biographical right. and the stories are at times it appears painfully true and you know, right. there's a thing to it and it just seems, and it, again, he's done the same thing. There's an exclusivity. It's, um, I read it. I mean, there's articles about the show every single day. I, I, they right. seem to come up on Facebook. I read an article today that says that he is unashamedly not showbiz. He's not trying to dazzle, although he does. He's just telling the truth and he's doing great yeah. magic. And, you know, this is a show that has people queuing around the block. It's on its fourth extension. It's made $5 million. 
it's got five tricks in it. Yeah. It's like, it's incredible. Right. And not everybody can emulate that. But the five tricks are not the floating table, the yeah. appearing bowling ball from Sketchpad. That's exactly it. They're not those things. And, and not that those are not great tricks. They are they are amazing effects. They're great tricks. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. No. And there's nothing wrong with, if you're listening to this, uh, which I doubt that you are, but if you're listening to this, um, <laughs> if you're listening to this and your show has no truth in it at all, don't feel bad about it. No. Like my, my show doesn't it isn't all there i just no. it's okay to have ideas and dreams and do none of them like um just but start right why not you know and the first time you walk out on stage and you tell the audience something that is absolutely the truth and they like you for it it's so addictive oh buddy it, it just buddy. makes you want to do it more and more it's yeah it's so scary yeah and i think i think a lot of us who found magic found it because it was a way to talk to people out yeah. of you know we're all insecure at we the totally end of the day am. like but I, I may have a hard time talking to someone but if i can do a card trick for him yeah and so what happens is we we buy a trick because of the patter yeah you know what i mean because it i get to say these things and people are gonna the only thing i would feel bad about that if your if your show is those tricks that you listed before and it doesn't have any of you in if you ever leave a show thinking that audience really liked me tonight they probably didn't they liked kevin james they liked lasanda oh, yeah. they liked all of those superstars that you like they yeah. liked your influences they didn't like you because there was none of you in it but still do those tricks but put some of you in it yep it's like you know and it's not that hard and it's really it's the easiest way to write jokes or write whatever because the truth of your everyone's funny socially right yeah but most people don't write it down most people don't <laughs> write it down and most people are afraid to put it on stage this is why comedy is so much more popular than magic because yeah. the audience know when they go to a comedy store they're getting a real guy yeah you know, in the main unless of course you're you know a bit abstract or you're a one-liner or you're Stephen wright or mitch hedberg or something right. but you know in the main if you go and see bill burr you know that Bill Burr is talking about being Bill Burr. Right. And if you go and see, I don't know, any comedian, you know that you're getting the real guy. And it's so popular for that reason. Right. And that's why they don't necessarily like magic because they know that they're getting lied to. They just don't realize how much. And they, if you could give them a person to identify with and still fool them, I think they would like that better. Dude. <laughs> it's so damn good man i think that i have to be honest and say that the reason i'm so passionate about this is because it's also the thing that i'm trying to do the most too yeah you know i think the challenges that you've conquered you forget about and you're not passionate about them so the very fact that i care about this so much is the biggest indicator that i haven't achieved it yet right and so there's no preaching at all or anything yeah, like that no, it's just I, like you know we're all trying to trying to achieve something but ultimately um the f when you first go on stage you think it's all about putting up barriers and yep. actually you realize that the best thing to do is take them all down and it yeah. takes so long it can take 10 years of standing yep. in front of people to finally learn how to be yourself and again it sounds it does sound very preacher right now just go for it man I'm bro ready. but when i know when i say that i'll say it this way <laughs> um I have four effects right now that I absolutely love and I feel are 100% mine. Yeah. And You're I, lucky. Four and is I lot. have eight that I do. And every time I do them, I feel like, mm, yeah, it's not okay. And it's not, it's not because I'm, these are marketed effects or they're based off of concepts or ideas that are made available. It's yeah. not taking someone else's thing, but I found myself doing a piece that I was like, I love doing this piece. And it was my opener, and it's a well-known opener that a lot of guys do. Okay. And I talked to my wife one day, and I said, all the reasons I love this are the things that over the last three years I've written in, or it's a personal story. It's like everything around the thing that makes it mine. Yeah. But it's never going to be mine because it's built around this thing that you can back, go into it? a yeah. store and buy it. So I finally one day said, I'm not doing it anymore. And it was my, like guaranteed i know i'm gonna get them on my side and i just friggin' left it at home and i went to do the gig and i uh. didn't know what i was gonna do and brother i'm telling you i walked out there and i told the stories and i shared the jokes and i did the connection without the trick oh yeah and they were right there with me and i didn't need that thing do you know what i'm saying yeah. like it's i i have a similar thing of moving 
sometimes the lines are transferable. Like there's a, I used yeah. to do one of the things that the Jack, when Jack said to me, it's not the comedy castle. Yeah. I used to do like a five minute monologue before my first trick and I did it at the castle. So I'm five minutes in to a yeah. 20 minute show. They've seen no magic. And so the, the change that I did, and I was doing half dead silk then too. All I did was I took some of the jokes and the jokes, like one of the jokes tonight where I say, um, I, to I said to the doctor, I'm worried about my weight. I think it runs in the family. He said, nobody runs in your family. Right. Like that joke was at the beginning of my act. Yeah. And now I just put it into the half-tied silk. It's part of the trick. Yeah. And I find that the audience pay way more attention to the jokes if you're also holding a prop because they feel like it's going somewhere. Right. Whereas you can lose people in a magic show by just standing there telling jokes yep. because they're, they're thinking, when's the magic going to start? Yeah. But if you're holding a prop, they're thinking, okay, this is the trick. They See, feel like it's going somewhere. And so mm -hmm. you can take, if you've got a routine that you love because of the lines, but you no longer love the trick, you can definitely find a way to put those into something else. This is a, a huge thing that you just shared that I think a lot of people don't think about is in how they're introduced. Oh, yeah. So like what you're describing is you're at the magic castle. People automatically think I'm going in this room and I'm going to see some magic. Yeah. So you do five minutes of comedy and they're like, what's going on? Yeah. I, I really, but oh, it's, sorry. it's really important to, we always, we always want to beat our audience's expectations, but we have to go via them. Yeah. Uh, you can't, yep. if you beat them in a way that is, doesn't match them at all, you can miss them all together. You can leave them behind. So yeah, you like, go on, tell me what you're going to say. And I'll, I've got a, another thing that it links to. I was, I was just saying like, for example, in a, in a corporate environment, guys want to be like, the comedy and magic of. Yeah. Well, then people are going, this guy needs to be equally funny and equally magical. Yeah. If you are introduced as a magician and you do magic and then you have a couple funny lines, they'll go, that guy was hilarious. Yeah. But if you introduce yourself as a comedian and you come out and do magic right away, they're like, when's it going to be funny? You can set yourself up for a fall and you're not necessarily always, um, right. you're not funny in a way that they expect because yeah. they're used to comedians talking about real things that they can identify with. And maybe the, the one liner kind of comedian, which tends to be how magic works. Most comedy within magic is one liners that are related to the trick or a situation. Right. They're not like, um, so it's, uh, who's, uh, I'm trying to think of an example, Jerry, like Jerry Seinfeld. What's with plain toilets? You yeah, know, I think nobody does that and then goes into a trick. <laughs> right. They they tell a one liner. You know, I walked down the street, I did this, and then this happened, and boom, boom, boom. Yep. It's like a traditional joke yep. structure. It's very vaudevillian or music hall style, and it's not a kind of comedy that people are necessarily used to. Right. So by being introduced as this guy's a comedian, and then coming out and being a magician that has a few funny lines, it doesn't go via their expectations because it's not the kind of comedy they're necessarily used to right introductions though are the most important thing Whew. like did you see that thing that josh j published in magic i didn't he no. did this he uh, talked about intros yeah well he did this study where they because they say that um magicians have studied the psychology of audiences and how what they um how, sorry the other they've learned what they can do to fool audiences or whatever but this study is about what audiences really think you know huh. a warts and all look at how uh, audiences judge magic yeah and that it's pretty damning stuff i mean one of the things it says is that of all of the allied arts to do with magic sleight of hand you know comedy and all of those things mentalism beats them all hands down for if an audience are going to be interested in joining in and being at the show right. they are most interested in mentalism style things um it says that the thing they hate most is feeling like they've seen a trick before yeah. so his conclusions are that you know don't necessarily immediately go home and throw the linking rings in the bin but find a new way to do it. Yeah. One of the things he says is um, audiences, the thing they value most in a magic show is being surprised, but in a way that they kind of expect, like a way that makes sense. You know, if you're doing, a, um, a, what's it called? The gypsy thread. Yeah. And a guy dressed as a clown bursts through the curtain and frightens everyone. That's not a good surprise. But if it surprises them in a way that is logical, they enjoy that the most right. because it's like, Oh, we should have seen that coming. That's what they expect from magic. And, um, one of the things he comes to is that introductions are super important. They mm -hmm. had, um, I mean, you should check this article out. It was in, uh, it was in magic and yeah. he talks about it on his penguin live. Uh, Josh okay. has a penguin live and he talks about it on there. And, 
they showed videos of Sean Farquhar and of Ben Earl and to different test audiences. And they said, here's Canadian magician Sean Farquhar. And they, they watched the video. And then to the next audience, they said, here's FISM award winner, Canadian magician Sean Farquhar. And then it, to the next audience, here's full pen and teller, Canadian magician, uh, viral success, performs all over the world, FISM award winner, Sean Farquhar. And the audience's enjoyment of the video went up directly with how much they were told about the performer before they came on stage. Wow. Like they were expecting it to be brilliant. And, and there's a, there's a logging system of, um, being on television was rated the most highly for them wanting to see more and thinking it was great. Yeah. Then having performed for celebrities, then peer approval, then awards and things like that. Yeah. And all of those things make a huge difference to how the audience perceive you. So if you turn up to a show and the guy says, how do you want me to introduce you? And you say, ah, say whatever you want, just get my name right and I'll do the rest. Mm. That is the worst thing that you can do. Yeah. And the Magic Castle understand that because they, five months before you perform, they say, tell us so exactly what you yep. want to say. And not only do the the hosts they they learn it they yeah. don't just read it off their phones or off a card they learn it verbatim and they walk out and they say it to the audience in a way that makes the audience feel like they really do know it is there anything worse than the guy introducing it goes here comes a great friend of mine he's called um and then they get the bit of paper out and they're like please welcome uh, matt james and i'm like it's mark james is you know and the yeah, guy yeah. gets it wrong then yeah. that's the worst so having someone introduce you in a way that's genuine and say some things about you that will make the audience like you and be excited to see you. The comedians always used to say like, Jerry Seinfeld has an interview and I can't remember who it's with, but um, he says, a comedian once introduced me and said, the funniest comedian you're ever going to see. And he right. walked on. And after he came off stage, he said, don't ever do that to a comedian. Again, it's the worst right. thing you can do. And he may well have been wrong. Based on the test audience, you know, maybe saying the funniest comedian you're ever going to see. I don't know, the audience, if they think you've got some achievements, you're not just some guy off the street. Yeah. Their expectation is going to be high and provided you can deliver, you're going to have a better show. So use it, but have a written intro and, you know. It may also be a big, big deal with magic too, because so many people have have no concept that you can even do magic professionally. Oh, yeah. Like if I say, here's a comedian and he's been on Conan. Yeah. And then if I say, here's a magician who's a full-time performer, you might spend the first time minutes going, how the hell does he pay us? Yeah. Because I, I can't tell you how many times I've done a show and someone goes, that was so fun. I had a great time. That was amazing. What do you do for a living? Yeah. <laughs> do you do a lot of shows? It must be difficult. You drive for Uber. You can fit that in everywhere. Right. Right? <laughs> it's like, that's what they think. Dude, I've, had it on, I've been working on a cruise ship. And, you know, I'm spending two <laughs> weeks on this cruise and I'm doing my shows and people come up to you like, oh, that's the greatest show we've ever seen. What job do you do back home? Yeah. It's like, I do this. You think I'm taking two weeks out <laughs> on a vacation to do this? Like, of course, this is my job. Or, right. you know, what else do you do on the ship? I think, I'm shocked you can pay the bills as a plumber. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Like, oh, you got a real job? Like, this is right. a, When we went, we had our son, my son Joshua is six, and we went to... Um, the the you have to go to the, the town hall kind of thing when you have a baby in England and um you register them you know I guess you have to do that everywhere okay. but you have to do it within two weeks of the birth and you go and you register your child and we both sat opposite this woman and she said so Sarah my wife what do you do for a living and she said oh I work in retail and then she said and how about you because they write it on the birth certificate <laughs> and um I it's said, on the birth certificate so they, they put your they, <laughs> they put the occupation of the parents on the birth certificate. <laughs> So uh, there's an opportunity for fun there, but you yeah. can't. You have to tell the truth. It's like this legal requirement thing. I mean, your job could change every day, but right. you know, whatever you're doing the day you're that registered, day, to, yeah. that is on your kid's birth certificate forever. That's so fantastic. They ask you the job, and I said, "Oh, I'm a magician." And she went, "Oh, that's amazing! Like, do you perform locally, or what do you do?" And I was like, "Well, I do this, this, this." And she went, <laughs> "That's really cool." Okay, so what do you do for a living? And I'm like, magician? She went, you want me to write magician on the birth certificate? And I went, <laughs> well, you can write astronaut, but what magician is what I do. Yeah. That is my only job. And she went, "You magic is your... She just couldn't believe it. Yeah. And it got to the point where I started getting offended. I'm like, right. can you write magician so we can get on with this? You know, because she just didn't believe me. Yeah. And, and people don't. It's strange. And yet, I mean... I can understand why making a living from magic can be tough and it's, right. you know, it's, but, but it can be done. <laughs> yeah, it <laughs> so, can be done. Well, let's, let's talk about that because this is about to break. About to break. <laughs> and yeah. after the first, uh, you know, 50 minutes here, everyone's going to think we're 
experts and nothing ever goes wrong. We have oh, no, 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 no challenges no whatsoever. <laughs> what is what has been in this business one of your breaking points or one of your moments where obviously you're not broken, but yeah. one of your moments where you've thought because we've all had those moments where we're like, what are we doing? Like I want to give this up. Yeah, uh, I don't know, man. There, there's been a lot. I mean, there are just real tough shows. You know, we all have them. Like you can have a tough show. The worst is when you think it's going to be great, or you know, there's someone <laughs> you go out and you just completely die. <laughs> Or there's going to be someone in the audience who re you really want them to see the show or whatever. Yeah. One of the things I've really realized about having a tough show is that, so one of the things I do in the UK is I warm up audiences for TV shows. And um, before they record, you know, I'll go out and I'll talk to the audience and get them yeah. in a good mood. And then I introduce the celebrities that are on the show or whatever. And sometimes they're game shows or panel shows or anything like that. And there's a show in the UK. I haven't warmed up on it, but I know the guys who have. It's called Live at the Apollo, and it's a theater in the UK, and they put like 10 comedians on, and they film it, and then they put that on the TV. You yeah. probably have similar stuff here. And one of the things they say to the comedians is, even if you're completely bombing, act like it's going great, because <laughs> we'll make it look like it was afterwards. Yeah. Maybe the audience on the night will be slow or whatever. And sometimes, you know, you can be doing a show, and you think that it's going terribly, and you come off, and they're the shows where people go, wow, that's that was great. Yeah. <laughs> there's no set reaction to magic. Right. One of the things that's really, um, I, I heard a podcast with Luke Jamey, you know, the mentalist. Yeah. Luke Jumet? Yep, yep. I had a, he said the most perfect line about this. He said, I hate when people applaud a trick because all they're <laughs> saying is I accept the successful conclusion of your theatrically pre-planned novelty. <laughs> it's such a perfect <laughs> sentence and it's true. And, <laughs> I've heard uh, podcasts with other magicians recently that, that go more in line with this as well. And it's that the truth of the re audience reactions is getting huge applause and reactions is what might get you booked again. They're good for the booker. But right. They, they don't necessarily mean a great magic show. Right. Like, it's funny, you know, I, I remember sitting backstage at a venue once and, um, talking to the guy who was the boss of the, uh, like the, the, um, the oh, what is it called the entertainment manager of the yeah. venue the place i was working and um i remember a guy being out front and he was a magician he was on before me it was like a variety night he was a magician and he was doing 20 minutes and there was complete silence then applause then complete silence then applause then complete silence and applause and in his 20 minute show there were like six times that the audience really clapped and otherwise they were silent and i thought as a comedy magician if that happened to me, I'd oh, yeah. have died. Right. That show is death. Yeah. If they clap six times in 20 minutes, that's a bad show. Oh, yeah. But if you just go out as a magician and they clap six times in 20 minutes, that's a good show. Yeah. You don't have to be necessarily funny. And, I, I <laughs> man, I don't even know what point we're trying to make here because we're just spitballing. But the, the thing that is like, I think that the trick to dying is to not look like you are. <laughs> The trick to dying is to not look yeah, like you're dying. Because the audience might, they, they might not realize. They might, they don't know that it's going that badly. How, yeah. many, how many times have you seen an act go out on stage and be like, hey, what's up? And do his first line and it get yeah. a bit of a laugh. And then they go, hey, let's all hold hands and contact the living. Or, you know, yeah. they do some sort of line that like um, admonishes the audience for not giving them enough. And, I, and you think they might be having the greatest time. Right. And just because they're not going wild, like don't, make them feel bad about it. Just keep doing your thing. Yeah. Keep doing your thing with positivity and as if you're having the great time yourself and maybe that'll be the show that is like your big, that might be the thing, that might yeah. be the show that breaks you and they go, that was great. And maybe the show when you cue the audience to applaud 12 times and you, you know, you do all of the classic techniques that make the audience react is maybe nobody really liked it. Yeah. Maybe they just thought, oh, we're supposed to clap now, let's clap. I don't know. Magic's I think we, weird like that. I think we forget that a applause or laughter or i mean the reaction is a reaction to something they should be feeling yeah not because oh this is when we clap yeah you know i i can't tell you how many times i've seen people perform and then just stand there like yeah like at the it's like no you're you're getting it all wrong you're doing this so that they can give you something but your job is to give them something. That's exactly your it. Your job is to give them an experience they couldn't have if I'm, they didn't leave the house. They don't owe you anything back, really. Either, These guys think. didn't leave their house, get dressed up, go to dinner, come to the show, buy a ticket, sit in this seat so they can make you feel good. Yeah. You're supposed to make them feel good. <laughs> 
It's funny as well, because usually like when comedians talk about audiences, they speak in such a visceral manner. You know, the language is like, I died, I killed, right. I murdered them, I slaughtered the audience or whatever. It's oh, yeah. all that way. And with applause or whatever, it's like they clapped. But with comedy, you say, I made them laugh. Yeah. Like they had no choice. Yeah. I made them laugh. Yeah. The thing I said was so surprising and funny that they could not help but react in a visceral way that I made them laugh. And with magic, you can do that too because people, they sit there open-mouthed or slack-jawed or they gasp or whatever to, at a moment and applause is not necessarily... It, the applause is like a reaction that they understand they should give, but a reaction when you do like human blockhead or whatever, and people are looking away and they've got their eyes closed or oh, they, geez. they, it, it is visceral, isn't the, it? The way that well, they, well, even tonight. So you, you did human blockhead. Yeah. We've said that a couple of times for those who don't know what human blockhead is. You take what a six inch. Yeah. I mean, nail. It, it's freaking like the diameter of a pencil. Yeah. D depending on the anatomy of your own skull. Uh, now, you can, uh, here's what I don't understand. So we can we can talk. Can we talk about it? All we this? can talk I about mean, it, yeah. F like why it works. Like oh yeah, of course. I, I mean, I think that um, people present it in in that way. They talk about the truth behind it, and anyone who Google's can find the truth behind it. I so mean, we're okay with this. We're yeah, good. yeah. I, I don't mean, think it's. I don't, I don't think it crosses a line. It's not magic. So but I, I have questions okay. because I know how it works. Like, yeah, there is a void in your in your head. <laughs> Yeah, I that think everybody has. The, the easier, some some are big, some are bigger than others. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> so you should tell your joke that you couldn't tell tonight. No, no way. <laughs> there's a reason that got cut. A, <laughs> so there, there's a there's a void. Is it behind your sinus or like? I think the easiest way to understand it is that when you look at a person. Uh, ordinarily, it appears that the nose goes up because the nose is, uh, you know, a downward, that the nose, downward oh, shaping thing. Oh, like the hole in your nose. Yeah, but when you see a picture of a skull, yes. there are just two large oh, yeah. holes. And so that makes it most obvious how it works. Essentially, the nail goes into the nose. Think of a pirate's face. Yeah, that's it. A it goes, dead pirate. You know, the pirate, one that, yeah. yes, the, here he is. It goes straight in backwards. It goes <laughs> a t across the top of the palate, you know, along yeah. the... the the roof of the mouth, but on the other side, and oh. straight to the back of your head. Yeah, and, there's um, just a hole, just a gaping hole. There's just a hole. And a, <laughs> a, a huge part of it is like the build-up and the performance to making the audience care about it. Um, and But the, you could, without the hammer, you could take it and you could just gently push it in as long as you've suppressed the reflex to sneeze and it feels awful and all of those things. Um, the hammering is really just for show. Yeah, it's this, here's I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah, I've I've done it. It still scares the crap out of me. Even when I see every other people time, do I'm it. just like, what do you? Yeah, I what if it go like it could? It, it, it could. It could go wrong. I mean, I've had it where it's gone in and I, I've pushed the nail beyond the tip of my nose where I couldn't get it back out, and it's like terrifying. <laughs> but. The real trick to it, the best thing about it is oh, there's no good lie. Lord. I mean, you tell the audience that it's a real nail. It they puts examine a it. nail in his face. Yeah. Till there's nothing left but the end of the nail. Sometimes they still don't believe Jeez. it's real. It's, oh. I mean, the thing that I didn't say it in the first show tonight, actually, because the, the line slipped my mind. But the thing I say when I intro the trick usually is, I'm going to show you something now that is from the sideshow. And sideshow is different to magic oh. in an exact opposite way. Because in magic, you see things that look like they're real, but you know that they are not. Right. And in sideshow, you see things that look like they cannot be real, but, but in they fact, are. they are. And yeah. So that's like it's like my, when people go, how does David Blaine make it look like he's sticking an yeah. ice pick through his hand? Well, he... That's real as well. He's I mean, sticking an ice pick yeah, that, That's just, he really does it. Oh, it's crazy. Geez. They kind of don't believe it's real, but if you can do bl blockhead is just, it's it, again, it gets a visceral reaction. Well, here's my question with it. I told you I had questions about blockhead. Right? Yeah. Because you said, de depending on the anatomy of your your skull or whatever, yeah, you can use a different, how did you, like, does it bottom out at some point? Like, did you ever, like, as you're putting something in your face, go, that's too far? Well, there, there are only two things that can happen. You oh, can, good Lord, you can try to put so, the nail in and I'm it fidgeting. <laughs> oh, okay, so what happens? You, yeah, you try to put a nail in. You can in. try and put it in and it's too thick, so it won't go in your nose. <sighs> so you just take a thinner one and you Avoiding try again. all the and, different analogies. <laughs> and, if you, yeah, and if you try one that's too thin, when you tilt your face forward, it will fall out. So you've got to find it. Really? Right it'll just, yeah, <laughs> it'll just fall well, right out. Well, I notice when you do the... Uh, the uh, thermometer. It, yeah, so I, I, you can make it go like. I can make it fall because the the thermometer <laughs> spike is thin. 
Yeah, so I, I, I do a nail. Oh, gosh. I, I have like a seven inch thick nail. Oh. Um, I mean, the one Melvin Burkhart used was like crazy big. Yeah. This was the biggest I've ever seen. But um, mine is like seven inches. It's pretty thick. <laughs> um, and, and my nail is about the same. And I, um, <laughs> and I use uh, I use a meat thermometer too uh, for afterwards. And I say, I know what you're thinking. That How hot was that? Well, I have a good way to tell. I have this meat thermometer and I put the meat thermometer in too. And it's weird, even though they've already seen it, it freaks them out more right. for some reason. I don't know why, but um, I mean, it's... Well, how... But okay, so you put it, you said it either doesn't fit or it falls out. But yeah. what about, I mean, length. At some point, you're going to run out of... Yeah, I mean, What's it back does. here, the brain? Uh, no, the, the spinal cord. What's is there anything there that's? No, it does touch the. Talk back about of the science. <laughs> yeah. You'll you'll know when it's too far because How? it makes you gag. Like it touches the back of your throat, and mine does when oh. it's all the way in. Mine is at the back of my head. I can feel it. Actually, I I, I don't do it because you can't see. But if I were to put it in now all the way and i moved my someone tongue. who jumped in at like minute 45 is going what the hell kind of podcast is this yeah it's weird right <laughs> okay sorry i What'd you say you should put it in just it was, <laughs> so keith is here he wants me to put it in i've left them in the magic castle otherwise i would but when i when i put it all the way if i wiggle my tongue the end of the nail will wiggle like you can touch it with your oh, tongue from the back jeez the the thing yeah the thing that the thing about that that piece that that thing it's so perfect for making it individual because the right. core idea is the same as something that you know a lot of people have done but the ability to put your own spin on it is so wide yeah and it grows so much because i mean i come up with new lines all the time just tonight in fact there was a line i said i never said before right in the first show tonight a woman covered her ears for some reason that was hilarious yeah I always, is that really really i so i always say to the audience um i say there's only one rule to this if i'm going to do it you have to watch no covering your right. face and i spotted that this woman had her hands over that her was ears fantastic and so i said to her you're covering your ears it's like you don't know how your head works right and then i <laughs> and then people lost it yeah and, and then, then i blocked my acted ears it out. and i said i don't want to see this. i don't want to see this <laughs> stop people. make it stop and i had my fingers in my ears <laughs> that was and it was so like, funny and then i shouted again even louder i said i don't want to see this and it was weird that it occurred to me and it like got this huge laugh yeah and then in the second show Nobody did that, but I pretended someone in the front row did. Yeah. And it got exactly the same line. There you go, buddy. And I was like... That's the castle working for you. That line's in every time it's now. It's glorious. It's there. And the, that happens all the time with a thing like that, where the, the trick itself is... I'm hesitant to call it a trick, because it isn't right. really a trick. It's so bare, it allows so much room for presentation. The trick is getting yourself to actually do it. Like, yeah. when, when you first tried that... Yeah. Did, like... I want to describe the moment where you're at the kitchen table and you're like shoving this damn nail in my nose. I'm going to do it. Yeah, it was. Um, I, I don't remember why I wanted to learn it. <laughs> I always liked stuff like that. And I have a friend in the UK called Michael Diamond, who's a um, he goes under the name Dr. Diablo for his uh, sideshow stuff. He's a great sideshow performer and he does it with uh, a nail. And then he says, um, I have I think I have a screw loose and he puts a screwdriver in there and he twists uh... it around. And he's like, oh, you know what? I can't quite reach it. And then he gets a drill and he puts a drill in there and it's spinning. And it's like Jeez. so great. And I see Make sure him. it's going the right way. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I just saw that performance of him doing that at a theater. Yeah. And it killed the audience so hard. And it was like, I got to I gotta do that. Well, the this kind of comes again full circle to what we've been talking about. The reason people care or the reason people react to that is they care. Yeah. It's a real thing. They get, I mean, even though they want to not believe that it's real, yeah. there's something that goes, this is different. Like, it's, this is more real. Yeah, they just know because all the props are handed out. I mean, another, there's another line I didn't do tonight, and it's specific for here. I always say, so, the nail is real, the hammer is real, the nose is real, and in Hollywood, let me tell you, that's the greatest trick. <laughs> and it's like, it's always funny <laughs> at the castle to say that, but I think because they know everything is what it looks like. Right. They've examined everything, it's really happening, and just the idea of it freaks people out. But even then, if you just pulled it out and you said, I'm going to do this, and you just did it with no buildup, I don't think it would be the same. Right. It's really important like my opening line i say um i talk about melvin burkhardt and i say he would do this thing 
that when people saw it, their reaction was visceral. Yeah. Either they wanted to cover their face, they ran screaming from the theater, yeah. they felt sick, they felt excited. However they felt, it was at the extreme of their emotion and it yeah. used nothing but this nail. And setting the audience up for that thing, it's like the trailer for a movie. You know, you see like, that if, if the ghost burst into the room in the first frame, nobody yeah. would jump. But because they see the girl sitting on the bed and they hear the creepy music yeah. and they see that the doors open and then there's like, was that a shadow in the curtain? All of those little things, they build the suspense to the moment happening. And yep. it's so important see, to it, okay. make the reaction happen. You can do this with a trick that's not scary. Oh, absolutely. You can, it, it's the difference between walking out and doing um, a cut and restored rope, right? Just coming out and doing a cut and restored rope, or you come out and say, when I was five years old, I never in my life would have thought that I would be standing here and about to show you what I'm going to show you. Yeah. All of a sudden, people care because it's like, well, what's he going to show Yeah, what's you this going to be? Like, yeah. It's funny, like, the even... Again, it comes to truth. You know, you can say, um, I, the, one of the other problems I think with magic sometimes is that magicians are very self-referential. You know, a lot of the time magicians will come out and say, I, uh, the first time I saw this trick or the first trick I ever learned. And I think the audience sometimes think, I don't want to see the first trick you ever learned. I, I want to see, see what you've learned in the last trick you yeah, can I want to do. see the best trick you know. Yeah. I want to see what you've learned like <laughs> in the last 20 years, not the first trick you ever learned. So sometimes it can be that and sometimes it can be mentioning another magician in a way that other art forms don't really do. But I think that if it really is the truth, it's no yeah. harm. If you say to the audience, if you're going to do a rope trick, you know, I'm not saying do this, it's not necessarily a good idea. But you know, if you say there is uh, basically an Olympics of magic because didn't um, the trick with the thing where the rope you tied and you move the knot what is tabaret? It? No, the it's walking, not tabaret the walking knot Pavel's Pavel, walking knot yeah. yeah didn't he win like the FISM award for like creativity so, or something yeah. like, with that trick yeah. so if you come out and say every uh, few years there's basically a, a magician's version of the Olympics and it happens uh, all over the world and the greatest magicians in the world um, <laughs> go there and they perform and one year this trick won for an audience of magicians this was the trick that fooled everybody yeah. it doesn't just fool regular people it fools magicians too and it won an award for its creativity um i'm going to show you that trick that's going to make an audience excited like, yeah this is going to be good in a way that here's a trick i learned when i was five years old right they think my kid does tricks and he's five and he's terrible <laughs> yeah i hate when he comes in the living room and says i want to show you this and i have to pause desperate housewives to watch the nickels to dance yeah. for the 50th time uh, it's like you know they want to see something great build right. it up and sometimes we can be afraid of that you know but other people come out and say i'm going to be the greatest thing you've ever seen or you know just do that just yeah be, just be just be just tell the truth and be uh, and, and if you're going to do that thing come out and say this is the trick that fooled magicians more than they'd ever been fooled before yeah or you know and then better be able to pull it off <laughs> yeah I find things people are, uh, uh, have in common and uh, have, you know, who believes in ghosts? Me too. Or who believes in ghosts? I don't. Or, yeah. you know, whatever. Or who's done this? Or, you know, when you do fire eating, it's like, I'm going to eat some fire. Oh, this is going to be good then. Let's do that. Let's <laughs> see that. I don't know. It's just, it's like, there's just a way, isn't there? Just be, just be honest and don't be afraid to just tell your story. Yeah. I don't know. You know, the people who are successful in this business, um, it character you know what it's character it all comes down to character dude let's talk about it it informs everything you know the reason yeah. that for me who's your favorite character in friends <coughs> my favorite character yeah yeah who's your favorite mm. person in friends probably phoebe okay that's interesting <laughs> It tells you a lot about a person. <laughs> oh, really? My, when I was a kid, my favorite character was Chandler. Yeah. And I think every teenage boy, they watch Friends, their favorite character was Chandler. Me too. Cause Absolutely. Cause Never think, Phoebe. That's who I am. They think I'm like, <laughs> they think, oh, I'm going to be the funny guy. I'm, yeah. You know, that's, it's easy oh, to yeah. identify with. As I've gotten older, my favorite character in Friends is Ross. Yeah. And, and I think that he's the most well-rounded, not even just because he was like the most famous person going in or the most well-known actor or any of that stuff. Potentially that informed the fact that the writers wrote the best stuff for him. Yeah. And I really think if you watch Friends, they did write the best things for Ross. But his character is so well-rounded. Like when he goes in that tanning salon and he gets tanned on the front four times and he yeah. says to that guy, I like how you look, what are you? And the guy goes Puerto Rican and all of that stuff. Like the <laughs> 
great <laughs> material that he has written for him. Um, the reason it's so funny is because you really know who he is. Yeah. And when things happen to him that are bad, you know how he will feel and you know how he'll react. When you watch Curb Your Enthusiasm, you know how easily irritated Larry David is. Yep. So when something happens to him and he says, are you outfit tracking me? Or I used the disabled toilet because this thing or whatever. It's like, it's so funny because you know who he is. Yeah. And... This, you know what? The people who've nailed this, Simon Painter has nailed this with the illusionists. Again, yeah. another example of oh, the yeah. most famous magic show happening right now. Brilliant. Everybody in that show is a, they're, they're so defined that they've made them caricatures. Right. You know, they've taken, they took Kevin James. He's the inventor. Yep. You know, they, they've taken everybody in that show and they've made them a thing. They're no longer their name. They're right. that thing, the oh, mind yeah. reader, the inventor. And it's like, that's why they work so well. Jeff right. Hobson is such a perfect example of like, he's a killer performer because yeah. his character is so well-defined and his character is not who he really is. Right. You know, At that all. whole sort of that he talks about like that Liberace thing and he's yeah. got that whole thing, but that's not who he really is. It's right. so believable and he does it really well, but it all comes to character. And so telling the truth and being who you are and wearing the kind of clothes that you like and having those little in jokes and things that are just for you, they help the audience to understand your so character good, man. because they, they're who, like when you walk around during the day and you just be who you really are, people get to like you because of your right. character. It's like, and this is where I think, uh, it comes back to, you know, we talked about like some famous routines or like marketed effects. This yeah. is another challenge I think in magic that isn't as much in comedy, like comedy, nobody's selling jokes to the masses. No. And, and if you do someone else's jokes, you're a hack or you're, you're, you know, you're not accepted because it's like, that's not how this game works. Yeah. But in magic, there's entire, you know, there's, you can make a career performing or you can make a career selling magic to other performers. One of the challenges is you can end up, and I did this for years, for years. I ended up with an entire act that wasn't any part of me. Yeah. And it could still have been killer. It was still great because these guys have worked, but it was great for people who wanted to see a show. It would never be people want to see me or people want to see yeah. Mark. You know what I mean? Like you have to make a decision. Do I want to just fill the role of a magician or do I really want to present something that people get to know who I am? Yeah. That's a big change in a person's career. Like if you take about to break in the opposite way, like the thing that breaks you in a good way. Yeah. Um, when people stop calling your agent or your, you know, entertainment company and saying, have you got a magician? Yeah. And they start saying, is Taylor free right. or is Mark free? You know, when they start asking for you personally yeah. for a reason, you know, they don't want, just some guy who turns up and does 10 tricks. They want the stories that you tell. Yeah. I, I heard someone else talk about this recently that, um, it like they were talking about doing a show and it was pretty informal and it was like a garden party and they did this thing and, uh, they did the, they were, so their friend had seen their real show and they turned up and they said, Oh, you do some tricks for our friends. And they did. And they said, do that trick that we really love. And they did the trick, but they missed the story. And the friends were real disappointed. Like you didn't tell the story. Yeah. That's the bit that we like. It's not the trick. We like the story. Yeah. People like stories. Yeah. It, you know, if I, that's why we get hooked on movies. That's why we love books. It's yeah. because of the story. Yeah. It's like the most interesting thing. Nobody's I, sitting and watching Star Wars without the story. That's Just it. the effects. Just the effects. It's, I mean, <laughs> movies that are built on that are dull. You right. Know, you need the story. Um, a good exponent of this in a, in a quite a modern way who puts things out for magicians, again, is Josh Jay. Yeah. If you watch his most recent Penguin Live lecture, he has this trick that's like a coincidence effect. And he starts by saying, uh, you know, in 1975, um, this guy was late for going to a restaurant and he did this thing and he, and he, you find out later in the story he's talking about his father and the trick is about how his parents met yeah. and the coincidence in the fact that it all ties up with and because of this coincidence they met and because they met I'm here and because I'm here and all of these things had to come together yeah. to make this happen and it's like a deck matching effect and it's so much more powerful it's so much more interesting because of the story Yeah, and taking two decks of cards and shuffling them and saying to the audience, here's something cool. We're going to shuffle these cards. And now if we look, this one matches it. They're right. going to think that's a cool yeah. trick, but they're not going to feel anything. Yeah. And, and, and they might remember the trick. They're not going to remember you. Yeah. That's all they want is to feel. Jeez. 
That's all any of us want, man. That's all any of us want. And, you know, we can learn so much from, from movies and storytelling. I'll tell you what, if you're listening to this now, uh, the thing that you should Google right away is um, the di- the dire- uh, Edgar Wright, the director of uh, the Simon Pegg movies like um, Shaun of the Dead and um, Hot Fuzz and uh, what's the other one? Uh, the, uh, the End of the World thing. What is it called? Well, uh, no, not World's End. That's Pirates of the Caribbean. Um I can't remember the other one of those movies. And there's a, there's a thing. It's on Vimeo and I think it's on YouTube. And it's like, uh, just search about Edgar Wright's directing. And this guy's put this video together. And it's about how Edgar Wright is such a visually interesting director because he uses transitions and different things to make the story more interesting. Like how things enter the frame. There's this thing where Simon Pegg, uh, his character in Hot Fuzz, someone goes phone for you. And then a hand with the phone comes in from the side of the screen. And it's a visually arresting joke. Yeah. And he talks about about how um have you seen the movie is it lock stock and two smoking barrels yeah it, wh- which is the one is it, it's lock stock or um the other the other movie that's like that snatch yeah where the guy has to come from london to go and get the jewels the american guy goes from london to from america to london to get the jewels and it's like a five second flash frame where you see him like at the airport and then he downs the shot and then he's at the london airport then there's a taxi and it's like it tells the story yeah And this basically compares the way that Edgar Wright directs, where if someone is moving from one city to another, they, um, there's a picture of them driving over a bridge and there's some music and there's a sunset and now they're in the new place and it's really boring. And it talks about how Edgar Wright does that in a really interesting way. And the track, you've got to watch this video to really see what I'm talking about. It's on Vimeo. Vimeo. Yeah. If you just search like Edgar Wright's directing, it will, you'll find find it. I'll put a link in the show notes. Amazing. I'll find it too. And I'll, I'll give it to you. And it, um, it just, what I learned from that is, Magicians put no effort into how we transition. No, it's there's a trick and then another trick. Yeah, and there's space for entertainment in everything, in every inch, yeah. in every nook and cranny. That's in every inch. You know, have you seen Any Given Sunday? Inch by inch, no. that Al Pacino speech. Watch that too. Any Given okay. Sunday, inch by inch. It's so good. There's there. He, he basically says the difference between winning and losing is that inch, and the inches we need are everywhere around us and the guy who's going to win is the guy who's willing to go that inch and it's not about the mile it's about inch by inch like uh, john guuastaferro's book one degree yeah don't try and make things a million percent better just make them one 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 degree better yeah every time and and there are ways to improve everything like transition in between tricks can be interesting and funny you can find some funny music you can cause things to enter the frame in a funny way like uh, that juggler claudius specht one of the things i love about him is he juggles loads of clubs but he has this table and it's on wheels but it's electronic and his table moves around the stage and <laughs> kind of follows him and rather than him going to pick a club up the club fires out of his case and he catches it uh, it's a really interesting way to do a juggling yeah. act like what if in your act you said to the audience so for this trick i need a book and the book spun out of your case and you caught it, you know, yeah. in a really cool way. You were stood there on the spot. And as you stood there, you said, I need a book. And the book fired out of your case right into your hands. That would be so funny. Yeah. Or you could walk over to the case and you could pick it up. Right. I know which one's better. Yep. I don't do the other one, but I know that it would be better. Like there's a, a funny way to make your, to introduce your props into the act. There's a funny way to transition between things. And we could learn a lot from Edgar Wright there in other directors. Um, there's a great video, uh, on YouTube. Um, Alfred Hitchcock talking about suspense Mm. and he talks about the nature of suspense. And he says, this is suspense. Four people are sitting on a train. They're having a conversation. There's enough conversation that we begin to like the people. Then the camera pans under the table and we see that there's a bomb and we see that there's a timer on the bomb and the people on the train don't know that there's a bomb. Now we've got suspense, but the real key is that the bomb must never go off. And it's like, there's a, there's, he makes this amazing point. You've got to watch it, but it's uh, Alfred Hitchcock on the nature of suspense. And if you watch that, you'll learn something about how can I use that in magic? How can I like, instead of just looking at magicians and going, Lysander does this great floating table or Kevin James has got this bowling ball or this thing. Like the most popular thing on the planet is movies. Yeah. Go look at some movies and find out how they tell stories and the things that they use, the tools, suspense, transition, music. Music is killer. Like there is no bigger cheat to transform an audience into a place that, I mean, I use a lot of music in my show, as you'll have seen tonight. Yeah. And finding the right music can be the difference between an audience thinking something is cool and crying their eyes out at a piece. You know, there's a, there's a reason that people love 
watching David Copperfield fly. Oh, dude. It's, it's that the, music. Yeah, it's it so swells cool. and you, it tells the story for him. It puts people in a place. The other thing that I think is really under, um, underused in magic, we don't use it at all, is smells. You know, you smell a thing like a smell can put you back in your mother's kitchen as a kid. It can put you at the fairground. It can put you anywhere. And I really would like uh, to find a way to do this. I have a routine. Uh, I do cups and balls in my show. Yeah. And it's like uh, the whole point of it is that it magic looks different wherever you see it around the world. So if you were to see this trick in France, they use three cups and three balls and it looks like this. And I do a phase and then I eliminate one cup. And I say, but if you, and that bit is in French too. And I say, <laughs> if you were to see this in Spain, they only use two cups and it's like this. And then I move one cup and I say, but if you see this trick in America, it's just one cup and I do like a chop cup phase. And then at the end I say, um, I produce a baseball. And I said, but remember in France and I produce an onion. And I said, but in oh, Spain, and then there's cool. an orange. And I said, but I come from England where we drink tea, which is great with lemon. And I produce the lemon. And I would love to say like, so if you were to see this trick in France and then the audience can smell like French onion soup or something, you know, like some way to do that. <laughs> Someone or, in the wings with a fan. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or imagine you're telling some story about, I went to the fairground as a kid and, yeah. and there's like this fairground music in the background, but they can suddenly smell candy floss yeah. or when was the last time you saw a great movie and they can smell popcorn? Oh, yeah. Like, being able to use smells in a magic show would be amazing. Oh, I love that. that Dis could put Disney's on to some of that stuff, man. They're doing that they really some of are, rides. Yeah. And oh, and they pump the smell of popcorn and candy floss around the place. It, yeah, it doesn't come from those stalls it. that sell it. They they put that smell oh, yeah. out there. Main I mean, Street. There's the show called Ghost Stories that was written by Andy Nyman. And um, I want to say Reese Shearsmith. I think that is correct. And they put it in the West End and it's been turned into a movie. Um, and they used smells in that too. They had like, there's this bit where this guy's telling this ghost story and the smell of bleach comes over the audience and it oh, gives them dear. this, again, visceral reaction. Oh, totally, yeah. It like affects them in a deep way. Being able to use that in magic would be amazing. But we, how many of our audience's senses are we affecting right. they have touch sight sound smell it's like we, we can reach them on more levels than just the visual you know we can do more and and again make people feel they just want to yeah. feel that's all they want they want to feel something and they might see a cool magic show where you really fool them they but what, but is that the point? I, you know what I mean? Like I, I don't think, think they'll talk about it the next day, or they'll talk about it, but they'll right. talk about the tricks. Yeah, they won't talk about the performer. Yeah, you may, yeah, it's the same thing between a musician. You know, how many times do you see musicians play the same song? Yeah, but then you see, I saw this one guy sing Hallelujah, and it just broke me down, and oh, it yeah. reminded me of my dad. And you know what I mean? And it's that's really what we're getting to. It's not about fooling. It's not about laughing. It's about getting them to feel. It's about getting them to feel. That's it's all. Freaking amazing. That's all. They, that's all they want. They want Dude, to feel. We're freaking at like ninety minutes here. It's crazy. Can you believe that? <laughs> we're at ninety minutes, and it's a uh, two oh eight in the morning. Yeah, I really ramble on. I told you, dude. It's glorious. Here's what I love: is if I wasn't watching the time, because my wife will be wondering when I'm going to get home. Yeah, uh, we could, we could, uh, dude. This could be three or four hours without even thinking about it. <laughs> this is great. That's a good sign, man. That's how you know it's like we're doing the thing. Yeah, I don't feel like we even scratched the surface. We didn't. Well, we're gonna have to do. We're gonna have to do a part two. I feel like what we've done is we've asked a lot of questions. We have. What do you think about this? <laughs> We haven't really given any answers. And I, and I think answers, the answers are personal to everyone. Yeah. My answer is not going to be the same as yours. And maybe you'll never find it. But you're a, if you're looking, you're ahead of the guy who isn't. The, the question, asking the question, that's the point, yeah, right? I it. mean, that's the point. Like, I think, I think part of what we're bringing up here is for so long, at least for me, I didn't ask the questions. Yeah. I just did the thing. Oh, this is the trick and these are the words that come with it. And that's what I did. I was exactly the same. It's it's funny, isn't it? Because you can you can convince yourself that doing well and getting reactions and everything is enough. Yeah. But it, it's not enough to stand out. Right. It's enough. You can make a living. Of course. Yeah. You can do Bold and Ball and, you know, Vanish and Mandana and Snowstorm. And, and I used to. And yeah. I made a living. You know, I've been a magician for 11 years and six of them. I did those tricks and I did all right. Right. You know, I never had to get a different job or anything like that. But... It wasn't enough. It yeah. keeps you in a certain bracket. The other thing is as well, that's not necessarily true in other art forms that I've really come to realize because of shows like The Illusionists and things like that, the bet and Franz Ferrari's House of Magic and all of those gigs, the, I don't think that's going anymore. No, no it's closed. Yeah, yeah. It. Yep. What, the best gigs in magic 
as I, as far as I can tell, are booked by magicians. Yeah. Like magicians are involved in the booking of the best gigs that are available to us. And they us. want to see something unique and different. They want to see something yeah. unique. Yeah. Because even if the audience thinks that Vanishing Banana is the most hilarious thing they've ever seen. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, they do. Right. You know, an audience that has or hasn't seen that trick before is going to laugh when you do that for them. Yeah. But you're not going to get the best gig in magic doing it. Yep. Because nope, not at all. The guy who books that isn't going to do it. You know, Simon Painter from the illusionists, he's not going to book you doing that trick. Yeah. If that's where you want to be. And, and that's a good gig. It's a really and whatever good gig. you think is a good gig. It's better than you think. Yeah. <laughs> And, it, and you get to, I mean, even just working alongside those performers. Amazing. I'm certain that everybody who gets in that show, not only gets in it because they're amazing, but finishes up way better than they were when they went in. Yep. Because you're not only considered now one of the greatest performers on the planet, but you're hanging out with the other five. That's right. And they're all watching your act and they're all going, what about if you did this? That's right. And they've got their unique perspective. And just being in that room, the doing that trick that is nothing to do with you and it's not going to get you in that room. Yeah. It's, um, I don't know. You gotta, you gotta do something different if you want to get there. And again, I am not the, a good example of it. I don't have it. Simon Payne is not ringing me up. Yeah, me He's neither. not saying, you know, I saw you do that half dyed <laughs> silk and wow, it really made me cry. <laughs> so, you know, and it's, but you've got to have something. Yeah. And it, it starts with character telling the truth, being personal. Good magic should be the least you can expect. Like the tricks working and fooling people. That's yeah. the baseline. If you haven't got that, there's no excuse. Like yeah. that's the baseline. Um, but I remember Paul Kozak, you know, saying once, there's a real thing in magic now where people go, this trick resets in two minutes. No sleight of hand. <laughs> Easiest thing you're ever going to buy. Yeah. Like, you know, you, a baby could do it. And you think like, I remember Paul Kozak saying on his DVD, you're a magician. So act like one. And yeah. You, you got into this because you enjoyed practicing. Yeah. You, the thrill of the chase. Howard Hamburg, who is a member of the castle, like plenty of people know him. He's a legend. Yeah. I saw him today. I went to the Magic Apple in Studio City and he was just sitting there at the table. Yeah. And he was just fooling around with some cards and he went, you want to see something? And if Howard says you want to see something, you, you say, yeah, I want to see something. Cause this guy like was friends with Charlie Miller Vernon. You yeah. Know, this is like oh, yeah. one degree of separation from the greatest magicians we've ever had. Right. And he showed me this thing that just blew my mind. Yeah. Incredible. Yep. And. There's a guy who practices. Yeah, that's and right. And he's been practicing for 60 years. Yep. You know, like Di Vernon had that line in his act where he goes, um, I'm 78. Um, I've been doing magic uh, for 72 years. I wasted the first six years of my life. <laughs> that's that fantastic. There's a guy who really loves magic unashamedly. Yeah. The best thing you can say for an audience, and I sometimes do at the castle, I walk out and I say, hi, my name's Mark, and I love magic. Yeah, buddy. It's a sweet line. I Just walk it. out and say, this is my name and I love magic. Don't apologize for what you are. Just be Jeez. it. Jeez. I'm a magician. I love it. And I if you give me a it. second, you're going to love it too. That's so good, dude. I think, try that. You just walk I'm out. Gonna. I'm going to. Hi, my name's Taylor it. and I love magic. I'm going to try it tomorrow night, dude. Even that, it just, is so, it feels so sincere. It changes the whole dynamic too. It really does, Because yeah. then, then it takes it away. You're not trying to prove anything to anybody. Yeah. You're going to do this whether they want to see it or not. Like you're doing it because you love it. And I have those lines in my show where I say, um, you know, I started learning magic when I was six years old. And, uh, you know, people say as a kid, you can be unpopular and a bit of a geek and never get a girlfriend. And all of those things happened to me once I started learning magic. <laughs> I, and, you know, that's like, those lines are funny. Yeah. But the audience, they love it when someone walks out and goes, hi, I'm Dave and I love magic. Yeah, but Because you're not apologizing for what you are. You're not apologizing for why you be there. Nobody else does that. Celine Dion walks out and goes, I'm going to sing this stuff. Right. I'm here. That's Let's great. do this. Don't be Unap ashamed. Unapologetic. Unapologetic. Love what you do. Put the effort in. Be yourself. <laughs> and let people love you. They will. You're interesting. Everybody's interesting by virtue of the fact that they're here. You only have to get into an Uber. Yeah. You know, I, this woman today, I met her and, and we were talking about some stuff. And she said, oh, I originally was in, uh, I've been in like six Ubers today. I can't walk anywhere because <laughs> I don't know where anything right, is. Right, yeah. The best thing about Uber is you don't need to know where you are. <laughs> That's like the greatest thing. Take me to meet. Yeah. I need meat. You need to know where you're going, but you don't need to know where you are. Right. Which is probably a good analogy for magic. Um, you just... You need to know the destination. So you get in the cab and uh, she said to me, oh, I'm from, uh, she said, where are you from? And I said, I'm from England, but where are you from? Yeah. She went, oh, well, I live in LA, but I'm from Alabama. Oh, right. What's it like growing up there? I had no idea about Alabama. Yeah. Now I know everything now you about do. Alabama. Or at least, I don't know about Alabama, but I know this, 
40 something year old African Americans particular view on what it was like to be in Alabama. And that's different from someone right. else in Alabama in a way that's really interesting. I, I know her story and it was great. And I wanted, when we got to the place, I didn't want to get out of the cab because she hadn't finished the story. And I <laughs> Take I, another lap. Yeah, I'm like, can we just, get, get, you got another right. Just finish the thing. Oh, Tell dear. me the thing. Because we get hooked on stories and everybody's got one. So think about what yours is and tell it. I love it, man. Dude, how can people uh, follow along and see what you're doing? I don't think anybody wants they to. They want to now, man. Not after they've heard. They've if been, they've made it this far. He just said. I know he's just like you're. <laughs> listen, listen, guys, your story is valid, not mine. I think that um, if you spend ninety minutes, <laughs> I, I think after ninety minutes of waxing lyrical like you're the Dalai Lama, it's probably good to fake some humility. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, if people want to catch up with me, I mean, uh, my website is markjamesmagician.com. Nice. There's a thing there. I mean, don't go to markjames.com. That guy's into like oboes and yeah, stuff. Yeah, don't go to that. My website used to be uh, unusualcomedian.com. That was like my first website. Yeah. And then my second website was like comedy and magic or something like that. I don't even call myself. Um, I used to say comedy magician. Now I say sleight of hand magic and comedy. If you go on my website, that's the tagline. Oh, I like Mark that. James sleight of hand magic and comedy so i even am in the billing i'm putting the magic se- the comedy second i want the magic yeah. in front and my website is not is mark james magician it's that's mark it. james magician so yeah, if you go to yeah.com com if you go to mark james magician.com um you can find links to everything my contact page um has like a form you can get in touch with me um there are links to my blog on there the bottom of my page has those little widgets that have my instagram my facebook um, every way that you can possibly get in touch with me, that you can send a pigeon to my address. That's fantastic. It's like everything is there. So yeah, <laughs> markjamesmagician.com. Awesome. I'm going to turn this off. We can keep chatting. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, man. So good, dude. Thanks for doing it. <laughs>